Hello, and welcome to All Our Little Messes, a podcast focused on healing through intentional conversations about parenting, relationships, religion, and more. I am your host, Veronica Winrod, and I'm so happy to have you here, listening in on my thoughts today. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome to our second episode of All Our Little Messes. Um, This week, we're going to be talking about some of the um, historical, I guess you could say, um, aspects of gentle parenting and um, its impact throughout history. I'll be going into uh, different Greek and Roman philosophers, um, church fathers in the Catholic Church, as well as um, some studies that have been conducted by various different universities and child... um, experts, I guess, parenting experts. So, um, yeah, let's dive right into that. So I wanted to start by going into the history of corporal punishment and its uses in the penal and school system. Um, it started like our, our understanding of corporal punishment within the United States is rooted in English, England common law, as a matter of fact, and it has its roots starting in the 1600s when um, they saw a rise in Puritan and Calvinist influence. And one of the things that was very heavily talked about was definitely enforced was um, the Puritan belief that children were innately evil. Um, The devil had to be beaten out of them from from birth essentially so they believe that children were born in sin and thus depraved and prone to sin they believe that strong discipline including physical punishment could bring salvation to children they also believed that all disobedience and academic error was the work of satan and children's innate proclivity for evil had to be destroyed through pain and humiliation Parents and teachers were expected to discipline the children using emotional and physical punishments. And so it was after that time, that time period, when Puritan and Calvinist influences started to rise in England and um, even parts of Germany, that they really saw a rise in the use of corporal punishment, both within the schools and within the home. And... It became such a widely accepted practice that it eventually was actually written into, like the protection of the practice was written into English common law. And so when people started coming over from England to the Americas, they brought all of that with them. And so like the basis of our laws are rooted in English common law. And um, unfortunately, a lot of those... um, laws on corporal punishment came with that. So there have been actually several, several lawsuits and cases where um, they would quote these laws as, as um, the basis for parents being allowed to exact pretty severe punishment on their children. And in one case in particular, I remember this boy was beaten with a, <laughs> he was beaten with an electrical cord, an extension cord, so bad that he had welts and bruises on his body. And the judge ruled that no extreme measures had been taken to discipline this child. And he cited this law, this in, um, in, I think it was in Indiana, actually. I would have to double check my sources on that. So I just checked my sources and it was actually a Supreme Court case in 1977. I got two different cases messed up, uh, mixed up. I was actually thinking of two. There was also one in Indiana, but on the one I was actually trying to tell you guys about was a Supreme Court case in 1977 where a, a boy was held down by two assistant principals while the principal 
paddled him. Um, he hit him over 20 times and the um, damage, I guess you could call it, was so bad that his mother actually had to take him to the hospital and he actually developed a hematoma on his his um, his rear as a result of this. So, um, and then there was another instance with the same principal where he um, abused another boy on multiple different occasions. Um, the last time before the boy was actually pulled out of the school, I believe, he struck him on the arm, the back, and across his neck. And I guess the the blows were hard enough that he could not fully use one of his arms for a full week. So after these instances is when the parents ended up filing uh, a complaint in 1971. And it escalated all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, Supreme Court, get this, the Supreme Court ruled that the school had not, with because they filed the complaint saying that the school had violated their Eighth Amendment protections against cruel and unusual punishment. And the Supreme Court ruled that that was not the case and that um, the punishment was not cruel and unusual. It was uh, fitting the severity of the crime of uh, one boy was tardy and another boy uh, had been accused of leaving the lunchroom too slowly. So they were told um, that it's fit the severity of the crime and that the protections of students, I'm uh, sorry, the protections of parents and teachers had to be protected. So essentially the protections of abusers and people that had hurt these these children, their feelings were more important than the bodily integrity and autonomy of these children. And so, like when I when I would read stuff like this, when I was you know looking into gentle parenting, like they absolutely shocked me because it was it was a clear case of abuse. Like there was absolutely zero question that this was a clear case of abuse. But for whatever reason, like the idea of corporal punishment being an like bastion of society has been so ingrained into I, I, I know very few people that don't think corporal punishment is necessary in order to become a functioning adult. Like it's been so ingrained into so many people that I mean, it. They they have to fight to get rid of it. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Like a teacher abuses two of his students, to where one has to be hospitalized. Parents file a lawsuit that goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and it is so ingrained in the minds of society that we have to be allowed to spank our children that. Even in the face of a clear case of abuse, the Supreme Court will rule that it was a necessary punishment because they cannot wrap their minds around corporal punishment not being necessary. Like, it's it's absolutely insane to me, and I, I can't wrap my head around it or understand it, but there we have it. Um, and it also, I mean, it also has had, um, it's actually been outlawed for, 60 plus years now, but it had its uses in the penal system as well. Um, even as late as the 1960s, I believe in the United States was the last case of corporal punishment in the United States. And this is not including uh, capital punishment, but the, the use of corporal punishment within prisons. And even that was used fairly heavily um, up until the 1960s when I think the last state finally outlawed it. But um, there are still 17 states in the United States that allow corporal punishment in their schools, 17 states. And like there are cases like Ingram and Andrews, um, which was that lawsuit I just told you about. There are cases like Ingram and Andrews every single year. 
Like you can, you can Google all of this information. You can look up all of this information and everything's there. There are dozens of cases like this every single year because every time they use corporal punishment on a student, they're supposed to report it and they're supposed to report the reason why, um, it was used. So yeah, 17 states still, still use corporal punishment in their schools. And I mean, honestly, I feel like it's not a stretch. It shouldn't be a stretch for anyone to think their way through this and come to the conclusion that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be using corporal punishment at all. Like it shouldn't even be a thing. And like it all, to me at least, it all comes down to the inherent human dignity that we all possess, including children. They are still people. They are not possessions. We are not, we do not have the right, as some parents think, we do not have the right to treat them as we please because they are our children. They are not possessions. I mean, children are not cattle. You can't just do as you please with them. And so this, this idea of corporal punishment really hammers that idea into people's minds subconsciously. At most, for the most part, I would hope that they don't actually think this, but it really fosters this idea that children are possessions. They are things that you own that you can control. And part, one of the ways to control them is through the use of corporal punishment where you can control, you know, their actions, their words. And in a lot of cases, you can even try to control their thoughts. So, um, I mean, there's been a gradual, very gradual development of society's awareness of, you know, the inherent human dignity that we all possess. I came across a very interesting quote by the early Greek philosopher Quintilian. He was a philosopher and orator in ancient Greece. And he said, I disapprove of flogging, although it is the regular custom, because in the first place, it is a disgraceful form of punishment and fit only for slaves and is in any case an insult, as you will realize if you imagine its infliction at a later age. Secondly, if a boy is so insensible to instruction that reproof is useless, he will, like the worst type of slave, merely become hardened to blows. Finally, there will be absolutely no need of such punishment if the master is a thorough disciplinarian. As it is, we try to make amends for the negligence of the boy's pedagogues, uh, meaning teachers, not by forcing him to do what is right, but by punishing him for not doing what is right. And though you may compel a child with blows, what are you to do with him when he is a young man, no longer amenable to such threats and confronted with tasks of far greater difficulty? Moreover, when children are beaten, pain or fear frequently have results of which it is not pleasant to speak and which are likely subsequently to be a source of shame a shame which unnerves and depresses the mind and leads the child to shun and loathe the light. And that quote just blew me away because, I mean, even in the beginning part of that quote, he talks about how it's a punishment that is only fit for slaves. And in ancient Greece, slaves, even though they were human beings, slaves were seen as possessions. They were seen as things that you controlled. They were seen as mere objects. And so even in ancient Greece, philosophers understood the human dignity that we all possess and that we are all entitled to. And they saw that punish, corporal punishment is degrading and humiliating and goes against the inherent human dignity that we are all, we have all been given by God. And so, excuse me, they, um, they even, they understood that, even they understood that. And what I also found interesting was at the end of this quote, they even 
kind of hinted at the psychological effects of corporal punishment on a child when he says pain or fear frequently have results of which it is not pleasant to speak and which are likely subsequently to be a source of shame. And I thought that was very, very interesting because there are psychological effects of which we do not speak. Like so many people end up in therapy and things like that because of the effects of corporal punishment and everything that goes along with corporal punishment and the, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the environment that surrounds the use of corporal punishment. Uh, another, another person who spoke out against what he called the extreme treatment of children was uh, St. Anselm, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. He was an archbishop in England in the 11th century, and he spoke out critically against, you know, the extreme treatment of children inside of of schools. Um, because again, these children were being treated as possessions. Like if they did not fulfill what was, you know, expected of them, it, like uh, academically, if they were seen as an academic failure, they were beaten for it. And so he spoke out against that because, again, he understood, much like Quintilian, the Greek philosopher did, he understood the inherent human dignity that we all are entitled to, we all possess, and we are entitled to respect from our fellow human beings just on that basis. Like, just because we possess dignity, we are entitled to respect from other people, no matter how old we are. And so even, like, these people, so far back in time, they, they understood that. And so, like, when I'm told that gentle parenting or authoritative parenting or not spanking your kids is this new worldly concept, it makes me want to laugh because for one, there is nothing new under the sun. Like, I mean, human history has shown that to us. We recycle everything. Everything we do is recycled. We make the same mistakes over and over and over again. So there is nothing new under the sun. But history also proves that this is, that is not true. You, gentle parenting as a concept is not a new thing. Like there were so many people and so many documented cases of parents practicing gentle parenting. And a lot of times it was based in their religion. Like it was based in the Bible because they had read the Bible and they understood that to treat your child like a possession is not biblical. It is not right. It, it does not follow any kind of moral code ever. Even, even pagan cultures understood this. There was a researcher who noted that hunter gatherer cultures. So, and in most cases, these were, these were pagan cultures. So, um, like native American cultures, uh, African cultures, things like that. Hunter gatherer cultures would practice more gentle and understanding concepts of parenting as opposed to um, industrial or farming, I guess you could say, uh, cultures. So as an example, just, you know, compare the methods of parenting between like the Inuit Indians in Alaska and the methods of parenting that the Anglo-Saxons practiced in England. So they were very different. Like from what I've seen, the Inuit Indians practiced more of a style of attachment parenting. Although some of their practices weren't always, I wouldn't exactly call attachment parenting, but for the most part, they practiced attachment style parenting. Whereas you have, you know, in contrast, you have the English, who were heavily influenced by, you know, the Catholic Church and um, their their methods of self-discipline, which bled over into um, 
disciplining everyone, punishing everyone. So you have that. And it, it's a huge, huge cultural contrast. So, I mean, even even the most savage, when I say savage sarcastically, even the most savage cultures understood the basic human dignity that we all possess and that we are all entitled to. So I'd like to go into now um, society's gradual um, awareness judicially of how harmful um, corporal punishment was. And there started to be a general outcry starting in the mid 18th century. Um, and by 1783, uh, Poland, the country of Poland, was actually the very first country to ban corporal punishment in schools and in prisons. So as early as 1783, they had banished it in, even in prison. So even, you know, hardened criminals who had you know, committed the worst crimes weren't being subjected to corporal punishment. And so, um, it started as early as that, but they were kind of the lone example for another hundred years at least. I mean, even in the U.S., corporal punishment or, or domestic discipline in this case is what they call it. Domestic discipline was legal in the United States until 1870 and as late as 1891 in the United Kingdom. Like, as late as 1891, you were allowed to physically discipline your wife legally and treat her like a small child if she you felt she had wronged you or committed some sin. You were allowed to spank your wife. And, like... People talk about spanking their wife and it turns into like this whole weird sexual thing. But in this case, like we're, we're talking about literal spanking here, like bend over my knee and I'm going to whip you with a switch, like an actual like birch switch I cut out of a tree outside because you did something wrong and need to be disciplined. So like the actual concept of corporal punishment, like I said, was so rooted in the idea that you owned the person you were inflicting this punishment on. And it, it infected every part of society, like down to the little teeniest things, like you were allowed to spank your wife. And I believe we can all imagine how that kind of allowance or that kind of law, those kinds of protections, what that would lead to. I mean, if you had a man who was not a good guy, who was not a good person, who felt that he was entitled to spank his wife, it more than likely would lead to a very serious case of abuse. And so... This wasn't just, you know, children that this was happening to. This was also happening to, like, wives. This was happening to their mothers. It was everywhere. So, like, it, it's, it just blows, it blows my mind. It, yeah, it just kind of blows me away how, how this was allowed in society for so long and nobody, nobody said or did anything like nobody talked about it and it, it took thousands of years for actual laws to start being passed against the practice like it had to get so bad that lawmakers were like huh maybe we should do something about it and so yeah like I said corporal punishment against a wife was legal until 1870 it was so widely practiced and was such a common thing that there actually was a law passed against it because it happened so much. Which is just insane to me. But corporal punishment in schools and the penal systems outside of the United States 
um, is actually banned in 128 countries, including all of Europe, most of South America, and East Asia. Um, Africa, it doesn't sound like a lot of parts of Africa have passed any of these laws. And um, in the UN, I believe the United States and only one other country are, uh, have adopted the UN stance on um, uh, banning the use of corporate punishment inside of schools. So I believe the, what the United States ended up doing was basically leaving it up to the individual states. And so over the last oh, 50 to 60 years, gradually, state by state, they've been outlawing the practice in um, in the United States to uh, practice corporate punishment in just schools. We're not talking about prisons. There are some states in the United States that have outlawed corporal punishment in prisons. Um, not all, just some. I believe the state of Idaho was the last state to ban corporal punishment in schools. Um, that happened this year in 2023, the last time I checked. But there are still 17 states that still um, allow corporal punishment in the schools. There are a few that allow it, allow the practice, but they haven't had any reported cases in like a decade. I think it was either Colorado or Wyoming was one of those states. It's, it's not, it's not important, but, um, so there are a few states where it's so frowned upon that it might as well be illegal, but even if, you know, even if a case were to go to the Supreme Court, like if, say, something happened in one of these states and the parents filed a lawsuit and it went to the Supreme Court, there are several cases now where they've set a precedent where I am not confident that the parents would win. It, you know, if their child was hospitalized, like in Ingram and Andrews, if their child was hospitalized or couldn't use his arm for a week or even sit down because he had a hematoma, I'm not confident that the parents would win because there has been such a precedent set in the United States due to all of these cases because the Supreme Court at the time felt that the need to protect the parents' so-called right to discipline was greater than the children's right to human dignity. So, I mean, until, until society can get to the point where we recognize the humiliation and degradation and harm it does to children to be subjected to this, I... It's not legally it's not gonna go anywhere. Like as society as as a whole, society needs to move in that direction. Like they need to understand that. They need to start viewing children as more than just possessions. I mean, that's how people used to view slaves. That's how people still use, you know, view slaves. Slavery is still a very common thing in the world. So that's how people view slaves. They view them as possessions. They view them as property and they treat them as property. And that is the exact same concept behind corporal punishment. I mean, you'll have these parents who will deny it. But anyone, in my mind, anyone who feels like they have the right to physically harm another human being because you don't think he's doing something right or he bothered you or he didn't do what you wanted the second you told him to do it. If you feel like you have the right to physically harm him for that, then you do not view him as a person. You view him as property. You view him as something you own that you have to control. That's all it boils down to for me. Like, I cannot see a way around that mentality. It's such a basic concept for me, and it's something that we desperately, as a society, we desperately need to move away from. 
So now I'd like to get into the studies that have been conducted by various researchers and universities on the psychological and emotional harm done to children uh, being raised in that kind of um, environment under that kind of parenting method. So there have been there have been various studies conducted over the past uh, of oh gosh four, uh, 50 years now. And several of them have been extremely extensive. I mean, there was one conducted by um, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa in Canada that compiled, they compiled over 20 years of different studies and research done by various different people. So there were 20 years of research that these people compiled and they proved you know, the psychological harm that corporal punishment does to children. And what I found really interesting about a lot of these studies was that when they were doing, when they were doing their research and studying the effects that it had on, on not just emotional development, but also on um, our brains, like how our brains form while we're going through this kind of parenting was that it, it was not on the same, it was not on the same scale, of course, but the part of the brain that is affected by um, severe physical trauma, severe uh, physical abuse and sexual trauma, sexual abuse is also affected by um, the use of corporal punishment. So what happens is it affects the growth of the gray matter within the brain. And the gray matter is actually, it's the salience network, basically. It's a suite of brain regions. It connects um, different parts of our brain. And it helps to filter and detect like cognitive and emotional information. So it helps us to process information that we receive from the outside. So in a sense, it's responsible for our IQ. And so if its growth is inhibited, then our ability to process emotion, our ability to process information that we receive from the outside is harmed. So they found that, so there was a study conducted by Harvard University that showed that the group found that children who had been spanked had a greater neural response in multiple regions of the prefrontal cortex, including in regions that are part of the salience network. These areas of the brain respond to cues in the environment that tend to be consequential, such as a threat, and may affect decision-making and processing of situations. So, um, like I already explained, the salience network is, um, it's technically, okay, so it's a suite of brain regions that co-activates in response to stimuli that are important or relevant for the organism. Its cortical hubs are the anterior cingulate and anterior insular cortices, which are connected to other regions involved in emotion, reward, arousal, and cognition. It helps to filter, detect, and integrate sensory, emotional, and cognitive information and to recruit other functional networks for complex behaviors such as communication, social behavior, and self-awareness. It is also sensitive to interoceptive information from within the body. Dysfunction of the salience network may be associated with various neuropsychiatric disorders. So... Children that experience corporal punishment, and this is, they, they, they use very, various different methods to prove, to back up the study. Um, in one study they did, they took a controlled group of children who had not been spanked and had been raised using gentle parenting or authoritative parenting methods, and then they had a group of children that had been spanked. And they developed a um, set of stimuli using uh, pictures of facial actors making neutral faces. And then they were also making 
scary faces, I guess. And they would show them these pictures in a random pattern. And the children who had not been spanked and had been raised in a gentle parenting environment showed very little response to the scary pictures. They weren't as affected. The children that were spanked had this massive spike in the prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain that is affected by, by sexual trauma, by physical abuse, and, and now they've proven by you know the use of corporal punishment within the home. So they were able to definitively prove that it does affect the brain. And like knowing what we know now, I mean, modern technology is an amazing thing. I mean, it, it has shown us so much about the way our body functions and especially the brain. Like we knew so little even 50 years ago. So like now that we know these things, like now that we know that these parts of the brain are responsible for behavioral issues like communication, social behavior, self-awareness, and they help us filter and detect and like go through our emotions and they help us to process information. They're literally responsible for how smart or stupid we are. That part of the brain that is affected by spanking is responsible for how stupid or smart we are. And they were able to prove to prove this. And this study that was conducted by Harvard was also confirmed by the study conducted by the Children's Hospital in, in Ontario. And they also compiled over 20 years of similar studies and research that also went into this. Um, there is another researcher. Uh, her name is Elizabeth Gershoff. She's an associate professor at the University of Texas in Austin. And she, she wrote, parents' goals in using corporal punishment, as in using any form of discipline, are to put an end to inappropriate or undesirable behavior and to promote positive and acceptable behavior in both the short and long terms. The research summarized above indicates that there is very little evidence that corporal punishment is more effective than other techniques in securing immediate child compliance. By contrast, a consistent body of evidence reveals that more corporal punishment by children, by parents, is associated with less long-term compliance and pro-social behavior and with more aggression and antisocial behavior. Taken together, these studies demonstrate that corporal punishment does not have the effects in parents intend when using it and in fact has the reverse effect of increasing undesirable behaviors. So basically, the use of corporal punishment may give you immediate satisfaction in that moment. The child may stop, but it doesn't actually, like I've said before on several of my social media pages, the use of corporal punishment does not actually stop the behavior because it doesn't teach the child why the behavior was bad. And so they don't actually stop the behavior. They just learn to hide it. and violence becomes a commonplace thing in their lives. So, like I said, it has a reverse effect of increasing. It increases undesirable behaviors, which is why in a lot of cases, parents find that they have to escalate the corporal punishment as the child gets older because it doesn't work. Corporal punishment does not work. I find so many parents that say, oh, yes, I only had to, you know, I only had to spank my children or I only had to swat them up until the time they were five. And then, you know, after five years old, they're just miraculously these perfect angel children that I never had to discipline. And I call bull. Because you can't just magically have a perfect child by five years old, by only spanking them once or twice, your child is still going to make mistakes. And you have already proven that your way of dealing with those mistakes is by spanking them, by the use of corporal punishment. So when they inevitably make those mistakes again, your response is going to be, 
more corporal punishment. And as the child gets older, you are going to feel the need to use harsher and harsher methods. It's just the natural progression of using corporal punishment. It's just, it, it's just the way it is. It's how I, I've seen it happen over and over and over and over again. I, I grew up in this and I, 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 all of my friends growing up were all raised the same way. And it's the same story over and over and over again. All, all of these people I talked to all had the same story. So hardly ever do they remember like, you know, the little swats when they were five or six, but they all remember the huge thrashings they got when they were, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old. They remember those because the corporal punishment always escalates because corporal punishment has the effect of increasing the undesirable behaviors because it does not teach children how to address the root cause and how to fix it. It does not teach them good behavior at all. It does not teach them the lesson of good behavior. And so that is also something that I found when researching uh, corporal punishment and another reason why I, I started to move away from it was because I, after seeing all of this uh, like historical evidence and then the actual uh, psychological harm that they proved was being done to children that were raised in this kind of environment and like, you know, finally addressing and acknowledging certain behaviors I had and being able to tie them to how I was raised. And after finally doing that, then it, it just, it really solidified in my mind that this is not the way to go. Our children deserve, they deserve more. They deserve better. And it's our job to give that to them. I hope you enjoyed this episode on the historical evidence for gentle parenting and against corporal punishment, as well as the psychological evidence to support the use of gentle parenting over corporal punishment methods. Next week, I will be getting into biblical, the biblical foundation of gentle parenting and uh, the biblical support for gentle parenting. And I'll also be getting into the verses that are commonly used to support corporal punishment, as well as into a couple of books that um, people in certain circles like to use to support that parenting method. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll see you all next week. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of All Our Little Messes. Please let us know how much you enjoyed it below and add any questions you have about this episode. Also, don't forget to follow us on Patreon for amazing exclusive perks, including early access to podcast episodes and bonus episodes every month. We've also recently added a support group for all of our paid patrons. You can check us out on Facebook and Instagram for daily updates and insights that mirror podcast topics. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.